All right. So Dr. Smithson, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about yourself, but I'm going to just say some things about you and people know. Well, first of all, the main thing, incredible human being, incredible. I got to uh, experience Dr. Uh, Smithson. Gosh, this has been like 2005, 2006. And uh, he was one of the cutting edge, quite frankly, uh, with sports vision and sports uh, training, all that kind of stuff with the eyes. And so it was really cool for me because I brought my little Blue Jays teams in there and we did some stuff and um, just kind of a go-to. Uh, love having people go to him. He'll talk about the sports vision, the training, how that's developed things that you can do at home on your own, uh, coaches. Um, also, Dr. Smith, I hope you, if you touch a little bit about concussion as well. That is a huge thing. And you are one of the tops in that because vision often is a key thing that creates a lot of problems with concussions. So um, touch a little bit about that. But he is the director of visual performance for the Nationals, the team optometrist for the Wizards, the Spirit, the Mystics, DC United, um, sports vision consultant for the Redskins, the Capitals. Uh, I know he has Olympic athletes coming in just to be with him. Uh, could go on and on, but again, uh, being a most incredible human being and spending some time with us, uh, you're the best. So again, enough about my blabbing. Um, I'll let you just take it away. And I have some like little questions and things to make sure we cover. But the main thing, you know what people need to know. And um, let's get after it. Well, it's very sweet of you, Susie. And thank you so much. And uh, yes, you are amazing as well. I've enjoyed our times together, which go back many, many moons, unfortunately, at this point for both of us, right? We're we're not getting any older, but uh, apparently we've known each other for a long time. And I'm not sure how that works, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, thank you for, for having me and, and I'm pleased to be able to do this. I mean, this is a, you know, obviously a passion of mine. I've been involved in sport my whole life as a youth soccer player and playing, uh, collegiately, uh, through the university of Delaware. So, you know, I took sports as far as I could take it before my little back and knee decided that it was time for me to do something else. So, um, sports vision and, and vision in, uh, in general was my way of finding a way to marry two things that I wanted to do, which was a career in vision and uh, optometry specifically and being around sports. So how could I continue to do what I wanted to do in the sports arena and continue the competition and, and being a part of a team, but not necessarily being on the field and getting beat up myself. And that was uh, what sports vision turned into. So um, you know, Susie and I met a, a long time back. Um, I am a local doc, so all of you guys are uh, around the area. I am in the area. I, um, I have a group practice called the Northern Virginia Doctors of Optometry. We have soon to be seven offices in Northern Virginia. So we are a large full scope optometric practice with 15 doctors, I think at this point, which uh, we do pretty much everything under the sun in the world of optometry. So you know, your basic eye exams, your um, you know, glaucoma testing, your eye health uh, assessments, uh, specialty contact lenses, myopia control, all these really cool things in, in the world of vision. Um, and my specific, you know, specialty was sports vision. So um, what that means, we'll get into a little bit. I wanted to do a couple quick little slides just to kind of give you some background on what this is all about, what makes it maybe a little bit different than eye exams that you all have had at one point in your life to get your own pair of glasses or contact lenses, you know, what makes sports and performance vision a little bit different. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, as Susie says, I'm, you know, officially on staff with every professional sports team we have in DC. Um, we have, you know, multiple docs that help me do that. I'm not as young and energetic as I used to be. So I have a lot of docs that will help me in covering, you know, being on site for, for emergencies and essentially every professional sport we have uh, to be on the sideline for things that happen. So uh, that's our, our goal. And concussion, as she said, is something that happens quite a bit, unfortunately, and has become a big part of my day-to-day -day practice is concussion management, concussion care, uh, concussion recovery. So we'll touch on that a little bit. We can talk about anything. I'm going to leave plenty of time for question answers. I wanted this to be kind of free flowing and open, and I promise I won't blab the whole time as well. So we're both good at blabbing, Susie and I, once we get rolling, it's wind us up and let us go. So 
Um, but I'll give you plenty of resources, some good things to go to and some take home things that you can do, um, you know, tomorrow with your own athletes, your own teams, if you're coaches, parents out there, whatever. So uh, there's a passion project I started called Sports Vision Pros. We'll talk about that a little bit, what that means uh, and how you can utilize it with the what thousands of athletes on Saturday Glory. You guys have a whole bunch of players over there, right, Susie? We we have a nice group. So yeah. I, our tribe is pretty awesome. It's amazing. So I'll do some quick slides, but um, we can just talk through you know a couple things quickly to give a little bit more of a foundation and a background to the conversation, and then we can take it in honestly any direction you guys want. I am yours and happy to do it. So thanks for having me, Suvi. Appreciate it. Um, the why, you know, we always start any conversation with the why. Any of us in business know that there's always got to be a why. If you're going to invest time and money in something, you have to know why. So why sports vision? And, you know, basically it's the difficulty of the game that we play. It's a very dynamic game. We're talking softball. Uh, we know how quick the pitches come. We know how fast the athletes have to react. Uh, the diamond being much smaller than it is for us at the Major League Baseball level and uh, professional baseball. Um, we know how fast that ball is moving around there. We know how um, how little time we have at the plate to make decisions on uh, trying to get the bat around and make contact on the ball. Um, so, you know, these are some of the milliseconds in the baseball world. I didn't have a softball slide, Susie. You could probably tell us about those specific numbers, but you know, the thing that, that, you know, matches up for us in the baseball world. And I just got back from two rounds of spring training physicals. I head back on Friday for the next two camps that we have, which is minor league pitchers and catchers and minor league position players. So, you know, for us, you know, our statistic is that you know, we have about three tenths of a second to process a 90 mile an hour fastball, which means that, you know, the athlete can have the best vision in the world. They can see crystal clear, perfect, um, have great muscular physical strength. Um, and only have three tenths of a second to still make that decision on whether or not they're going to swing the bat or not. Um, and that's a short amount of time. Three tenths of a second is quicker than you can blink. So that's a pretty quick amount of time. And that's a 90 mile an hour pitch. And I can tell you there's very few players in the major leagues that pitch under 90 at this point. So we're talking about much less than three tenths of a second. It's a very difficult game. Softball, no different, an extremely difficult and dynamic game. So the why is what can we do to make our athletes the best version of themselves what can we do with youth athletes to make them successful in the game that we all love? Um, and that's the why. So, you know, the, the performance, the safety, I think the two go together for me. I'm a dad. I have three kids of my own. They played multiple sports through multiple years. Um, some of the research that we can pull out very quickly on sports and performance vision, you know, we can find all kinds of things to talk about. Um, the enhancement possibilities, the ability for athletes to increase their, you know, ball off the bat velocity. There's studies on things like that. Um, there's effects on just overall sensory motor abilities and collegiate softball athletes. You can Google these things very quickly and find multiple research studies at this point, which is great because it validates the science and says that, you know, what we all know is that this is a difficult game to play. And if we can make that game easier, we have a better chance for our athletes to be successful. What the University of Cincinnati football study took, told us was taking it a step further and mentioning to Susie's point, uh, the safety aspect of vision training. And so what that specific study talked about was um, three years of concussion incidents and injury incident in general with the football team at the University of Cincinnati. They took then three years of instituting vision training, which will show some pictures of things like that, but it's essentially enhancing visual skills. Uh, not what we're thinking when we're talking about seeing clearer or better than 2020, those kind of things, but improving things like their depth perception, their eye-hand coordination, their reaction speed, their peripheral vision, their peripheral awareness. Um, these are all skill sets that we can improve in the world of sports vision. And when you do that for a football player, what they found was a significant reduction in the overall injury rate, concussions and otherwise. And the idea was that the athletes could now be more aware of that quick moving dynamic football game and see the blow that was coming, avoid the blow, make it more of a glancing blow and less of a direct contact. So we have a study now that we can talk about when we go to you know NFL physicals, which believe it or not, I just got the email, which is already in May. I think we just finished football season, but football is coming around the corner very quickly. Um, and you know, one of the challenges I have working with multi-million dollar athletes is taking a guy who's on a, you know, tens of million dollar contract and telling them that they're gonna get better at what they do by training their vision. Uh, a lot of them maybe just aren't even receptive to that. You know, they've already signed their big contract and they're a big shot. But if I tell them they can stay upright and safe doing what they're doing, uh, keep them on the field so that they can get that next contract, 
um, that sometimes resonates. So having the injury awareness part of sports vision, I think is really critical. And certainly there's unfortunately plenty of injuries in softball, right? We have a lot of ball injuries. That ball, unfortunately, is you know just big enough, just small enough to still make contact and, and make some bad things happen. So uh, being able to avoid contact and avoid blows is is great. I mean, we've had stories of, you know, really youth, young athletes that, you know, took a fly ball to the forehead because they just couldn't judge a fly ball in the outfield well. And sometimes at a young age, it can be as simple as not having great depth perception and good eye tracking. Um, and unfortunately, that injury sometimes sets that athlete down for a long time. So injury awareness and injury prevention is a huge part of sports vision. Um, the testing paradigm is something that I put over here. This is something that forms our testing um, when we talk about sports vision. So there's sort of a sports vision pyramid, we call it. Uh, just put some fun pictures over there just to remember when we actually had a successful baseball team in town. So you guys can all enjoy that because uh, there's been some lean years ever since then, but it makes you appreciate the good times when you have to suffer three times like this. So that was uh 2019 NLCS and being on mm -hmm. Howie Kendrick and his MVP trophy after. So pretty fun. And Juan Soto and I spraying a whole bunch of stuff on top of each other with our goggles. So that was pretty fun. Um, so when we talk about sports vision and the pyramid, the, we'll go through these three different kind of basic phases because I think it's really important to understand what a sports vision assessment is and what we're testing for. Um, so the foundation is really what we all think about as a basic eye exam. So it's making sure that the athlete has a good foundational vision set, meaning that they have good, clear vision. They have equal vision. We don't have one eye more clear than the other eye. Uh, in that case, sometimes athletes can wear one contact lens to kind of eliminate that difference. Uh, maybe they need those sports goggles or sports glasses to go out and play more effectively. Um, there's a thing called contrast, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, the foundation, once it's set, is only the foundation. Now we have to do other things, moving up the pyramid, looking at their muscular skills, the physical eye muscles and how coordinated those muscles are. And then the integration at the top is sort of how the eyes and brain work together. So kind of a fun way to kind of look at what these three different phases are. As I said, the first one is really kind of what you're all familiar with. You've all had an eye exam before. You've probably taken your kids in for eye exams before. Hopefully just about anywhere they've been able to get through phase one testing to make sure that this athlete can see well. They have clear vision. If they're not seeing clearly that they're being prescribed appropriate tools, whether those tools be contact lens related, uh, whether they be sports glasses and sports safe eyewear, not just something that they might wear to class, but something safe enough to play on the field with. Um, what a lot of times doctors will not do in a basic eye care environment is test for what we call contrast sensitivity, which is a critical skill set. It really has to do with not necessarily the quantity of vision, but the quality of vision. Uh, that's kind of the way I relate contrast sensitivity. What it means for our athletes is their ability to see in different lighting conditions. So we can have athletes that have perfect 2020 vision or 2015 vision or whatever you want to say is perfect for your sport, which is simply how well they see uh, a target at the end of a room that's 20 feet away, right? That's what the 2020 thing relates to. So it's how big that letter was that they could see. And if it's a 20 size letter from 20 feet away, that's considered perfect. Well, what we know is that we can have athletes that have that perfect level of clarity, but struggle seeing in different lighting conditions. And, you know, obviously at the youth level, you're playing in a lot of different stadiums with a lot of different lighting conditions some stadiums with not so wonderful lighting, even when we get to the high school level and the collegiate level, those lights can be very different. We can have athletes at the pro level that hit like crazy during the day and struggle at night. So things like that are what is contrast sensitivity. There's a way to test for that and there's a way to enhance that. So if athletes that don't perform well in different lighting conditions, we want our athletes to be consistent in all lighting conditions. And if they don't have good contrast, we can improve that in a variety of different ways. The phase two testing is the muscular part. So this is kind of the physical, right? So this is where the eye muscles, we have six different eye muscles in each eye that have to be perfectly coordinated to work together with those two eyes working as one, right? Working as a unit and an effective unit. And so we talk about things like eye tracking, eye scanning, what's called fixational stability. So they're kind of targeting mechanism. If we're gonna build, you know, kind of an invisible bullseye on every softball you're trying to hit, Will that athlete see the center of that target on every softball they're trying to hit? Um, their eye focusing speed, their depth perception. Um, this is one of the technologies that we use called Right Eye. It's actually a local technology. It's based in Bethesda. It's an eye tracking system. So that tablet-based computer system you see there has an eye tracker on the bottom. So we ask the athlete to do basic, simple things, follow simple movement patterns on this. 
uh, then this device and it essentially traces out what their eye movements do and how effective their eyes are at working together. So I'm going to show you a report of that later and what kind of uh, you know, readout we get from our athletes that we can then use to talk about what their deficiencies might be and what we do about it. Phase three is kind of where it all comes together. So this is another system we have in our office called Synaptic. What the Synaptic system is, is a multiple visual skills testing system. Um, so what they're going to look at is things like their visual reaction speed, their processing speed, which is sort of their decision-making capability, their eye-hand reaction speed, which is obviously critical for us in the softball world, uh, multiple object tracking, which is, again, critical. We think about, and sometimes you get the question, well, what do you mean multiple object tracking? We only have one softball, you know? Um, but there's multiple things moving at the same time. So think about it as a pitcher who's on the mound getting ready to deliver a pitch. The ball gets hit back to the pitcher. They have a comeback or to the mound. Now everything's in motion, right? So you have the player that's running off of first, the guy, lady breaking from third to home. Um, you fielded the ball. You have to decide what to do with it. So it's all these multiple things going on at the same time that still require quick and effective decision making. And these are all things that we can quantify on this system. This is what the reports look like. So this is the basic of a right eye report on the left and a synaptic report on the right. Um, so we can actually have age-based norms. We can have specific percentile ranks to kind of break down where this athlete is and some of their deficiencies. Uh, both of these profiles, what it'll do then is give us a plan of attack. So once we know where the athlete has you know, strengths and weaknesses, just like Susie and every other good coach inside of Glory, once you see that athlete and you know, hey, they have great speed, great agility, Maybe their arm strength is a little low. Maybe they're amazing at you know base running, but their contact is a little bit low. You know, we look at each athlete individually. We don't train everybody exactly the same, but we want to maximize the skill sets that every athlete has. So for me, it's about trying to find deficiencies, fix them. If we can fix them, then we move on to sort of enhancement and talk about enhancement possibilities. So these are what the reports look like. So every athlete that we run through these sports performance evaluations. Um, we go over these things, talk about them a little bit more, uh, and then come up with plans of attack. Uh, the plan will then include a variety of different things, um, sometimes refractive correction. So if those athletes are not 2020, 2015, you know, are we going to go sports eyewear? Uh, we tend to avoid the word sports goggles because we're all familiar with what sports goggles look like. And we didn't want to wear them when we were a kid, so our kids don't either. Uh, but there's a lot of cool sports eyewear out there that's sports safe. And things that you see even at the major league level where athletes will play in sports safe frames that can still look cool, but still be protective. So we would advise them on that. We have multiple different frames in the office so we can give the athlete a chance. So we always say, bring in your helmet, bring in what you're going to use so we can actually fit these frames underneath your helmet so you can feel comfortable with them. You know, we have everything from Nike to Under Armour to Rudy Project to Oakley to everything you can pretty much imagine as a sports frame so that the athlete can actually try them. We actually have a true sports fitting system so they can try multiple different technologies and find the one that fits best for them. Contact lenses, another opportunity. Um, one of the things you can see at the bottom of the screen is a sports specific contact lens. It's a lens company called Altius that makes contrast enhancing contact lenses. So that lens is actually specifically tinted for that athlete that would have a low contrast score to be able to fix that. So I have guys right now at the major league level in camp that are using these contact lenses in West Palm Beach, getting a chance to work with them a little bit to see if they like them for the season or not. At the end of the day, it's going to be what's comfortable for them, but we want to make sure they have access to every available lens technology, sports vision technology under the sun so that we give our young team, which is where our Nats are right now, our young team, a chance to develop properly and be back holding up shiny trophies in a couple of years. So you know, we get a chance to do these really fun things, but this is the time of the year in spring training where we have six weeks and we can really kind of um, sample some of these new technologies. So this is a very cool contact lens technology. It's a soft disposable contact lens made specifically for sport. Um, at the top, you're looking at some different kinds of visual training. We have visual training with strobe training glasses uh, and an infielding drill. Uh, have our former friend, John Wall, that used to play with us doing a vision training drill on his iPad that we developed for him. Um, a lot of these things are online and specifically prescribed so we can talk through different technologies that are out there depending on the athlete's deficiency and the virtual reality system which is you know again a huge opportunity for us to now put vision training into someone's oculus unit uh, eventually you know i guess the apple unit now as well if anyone's excited enough about spending thirty five hundred dollars for a vr system that the apple one just developed um pretty cool things that are inside vr 
there's obviously the baseball softball specific program, the win reality program, which is the virtual batting cage that all the athletes can go and take swings in their own garage, which is pretty cool. Uh, but there's also some visual skills games that are built inside of VR that I think are quite effective at training some of the visual skills we need for the game you play without necessarily playing the game you play. So those are some cool things we can talk about anytime as well. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to build a virtual reality training game, which I never thought I was going to do would be a video game developer, but I actually built my own video game, which will launch in the next two weeks on the Oculus store. So things develop just to do visual skills training, but it seems like you're playing a fun little video game that, oh, by the way, trains those visual skills that you need uh, for your game, whether it be ice hockey, softball, baseball, football, whatever. Uh, it's still those same visual skill sets we talked about before. Um, next steps, again, I am local. I'm around. I certainly am happy to see any athlete anytime. That's what I do. It's not running around working with professional athletes all the time. My day is filled up with youth athletes. My passion is youth sports. You know, like I said, I have three kids on my own and I coach as long as I possibly could with my kids. Um, I love sport. I love the life lessons of sport. So for me, the passion with youth sports is that if you make a kid successful at playing their game, they're more likely to continue to play it. If the athlete's not successful, they tend to quit. They give it up. They're not making contact with the ball. They're unsuccessful on the softball field. Um, and the worst case scenario is that athlete doesn't want to play anymore. And unfortunately, then they do lose out on, in my opinion, a lot of life lessons that come along with sports, you know, learning how to be a part of a team, learning how to work hard, learning how to, you know, fight for what you want and, and you know, really go after things that are important to you. Um, for me, that's, that's what sports taught me, um, playing sport forever. And really what I use in my professional life every day, um, is those life lessons of sport. So if I can make athletes more successful in their sport, then I think that they continue to play that sport and getting those life lessons. And to me, that's everything. So, um, we do basic eye exams using all basic vision insurances for the most part. So you can call any of our offices. NovaIDocs.com is my practice address. Uh, we have seven locations, all of Northern Virginia. You can get a full eye exam, comprehensive eye exam with contact lenses, glasses, you know, eye health assessment everywhere. The sports vision evaluation that I showed you, that specific technology is only available in the resting location. Um, that's where I am a couple of days a week. I rotate through a couple of our different offices, so I'm definitely there a couple of days a week. Um, certainly take a little while to probably see me, but, you know, that's why we have some time. We're getting into softball season anyway. You'll have a little bit of time uh, after the season potentially, but this is high school season now. I know it's pretty tough timing anyway, uh, maybe an over the summer kind of thing, which might be cool in between tournaments and such. Uh, but that's kind of how that works as far as getting in, getting assessments. Um, sportsvisionpros.com, I said I'd talk about that a little bit, uh, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. But sportsvisionpros.com uh, is a website I started with other sports vision doctors across the country. Uh, my partners are based in Portland, Oregon, Miami, Florida, Austin, Texas, they do the same thing I do with multiple professional teams in multiple locations. Um, so it's a free resource for parents, athletes, coaches, doctors. It's meant to be sort of the global, the global sort of Google of sports vision, if you will. We want people to find new technologies, interviews, engaging conversations. We're talking to our athletes, our coaches, our hitting coaches, all kinds of fun content on there. Um, we have a synaptic strobe playbook. So if you have a pair of synaptic strobe playing glasses, which I know Susie's very familiar with, you know, you can go on and learn some of the different drills that you could use um, in the synaptic strobe playbook. Um, there's a right eye training room that has, again, multiple different visual training drills um, that you can take out with your own team. If you're a coach or your own athlete, if you're a parent, have some fun with your kid in the backyard. I've done it with my own kid, I promise. <laughs> so I don't torture any kid that I wouldn't do on my own. This is all stuff that they will find fun, I promise. Uh, and we'll have some uh, some lifelong benefits as well. It's really, really cool stuff. Um, there's a QR code up here. This is sort of brand new for us. We just launched um, the Sports Vision Pro's Essential and Advanced Training Kits. Uh, this is not meant to be a sales call. That is not why we did this thing tonight, I promise you. Um, it's just literally launched last week. So we have QR code right there that takes you to our website on Sports Vision Pro's. There is now an essential training kit that would be something any coach, parent, or uh, athlete themselves could purchase and has all kinds of visual um, training uh, devices, let's say, um, that they can go out back, they can use, they can utilize. There's videos involved with how to use them, what to use with them. Um, there's actually a picture of my son on the right there using a vision ring. Vision ring is a great little eye-hand coordination, eye-hand reaction 
visual reaction, eye tracking kind of drills, super fun, easy to play. I used it as a warm up when I was coaching my baseball team, when I would have them out throwing the vision ring back and forth and they could actually kind of warm their eyes up before we got on the field. A lot of time, you have a lot of downtime in tournaments, right? Where you're getting ready for the field. You're waiting for that next game to finish. It's a great time to have a little vision training drill that all the ladies can do together. It's a kind of fun bonding time. That's the only time I let them talk to each other. Once they got on the field, it was game time. But during that, they can kick and talk around about, you know, where they're going this weekend and who's dating who and all the silly stuff that ladies talk about, but let them get a little vision training in at the same time. Um, so there is a pre-sale right now on the essential and the advanced training kits. The difference in the advanced training kit is it includes a strobe. So there's strobe training glasses inside the advanced kit uh, and a couple of what we call vector balls, which are very, very cool little vision training drills. I'm sure Susie has those as well. Um, so that was kind of what I wanted to chat quickly about on the Sports Vision Pro side, but it's a resource. Follow us on social media. We post all the time. It's fun. It's safe. I promise you, you your, your ladies can watch it. It's it's family friendly content, but something that's you're really designed to kind of engage you on different things you might not think about in the world of sports and vision. Um, so that's Sports Vision Pro is take a look at it. Join us. It's a it's a fun ride. We're having a blast with it. So um, that's really all I wanted to do, Susie, just kind of give everyone an overview. And then we have plenty of time for questions, answers. I know you had questions as well. So um, hopefully that's helpful a little bit. I know we didn't talk a ton about concussion, but um, if you want to wrap up on that, the concussions on my end, for the most part, there is many times a visual component to concussion. Um, the role of an optometrist and concussion is really more in the rehab side of things. So we don't do anything to detect concussion. Even when I'm on the sideline of the NFL, I'm not one of the guys that goes under the tent with the, me the medical professionals. That's our neurosurgeon and the independent neurologist from the NFL. So they go under, they diagnose concussion, they pull a player out of the game or let them go back in the game. What I end up doing is seeing the athlete after they have a diagnosed concussion. A lot of times in our area, that's through the concussion clinics. We all know that Innova has one of the big concussion clinics, uh, Innova Sports Vision. MedStar also has another big concussion clinic. Fairfax Family Practice has a concussion clinic. So a lot of the big medical practices have a concussion center at this point. They're doing the assessment. They're diagnosing and saying this athlete has a concussion. And usually when I see them and it's, yes, we have a concussion and we also think there's a visual component to that concussion. If that's true, the athlete comes to see me, we do a concussion assessment, which is similar but different to some of the stuff we talked about early in the performance profile. But we're still looking at some of those same metrics on eye tracking, eye movements. There's a lot of deficiencies that happen in those skills categories after concussion. So if we can identify again an, an issue post-concussion, we have therapy and training that we can use to remediate that, get the athlete back safely, get them back on the field when they're healthy and ready to play. Uh, but that return to play decision is still made with your high school trainer, uh, your independent doc, or whoever you're working with on the concussion management side. But we function kind of uniquely as the as one of the rehab parts of concussion. So that's kind of what we do on the concussion side. So if that answered what you had on that part, Susie. Yeah, I just wanted you to touch a little bit on that because I um, had a player, had a concussion, and fortunately she was allowed to come back probably a little too soon, but everything was clear, but she still had headaches and things of that nature. Yeah. And it was clearly something visually going on. So I said, hey, Eva, you need to go see Dr. Smithson. And um, after seeing you, then you were able to go and really give her some protocols and therapy and then glasses and so forth. And it just completely changed um, her life and what was going on because it was pretty devastating. So I just wanted to make sure that our families knew that when there's a visual component, um, sometimes mm -hmm. I don't think it's properly managed and yeah, that's, that's your lane and it makes a, a huge difference. And I know there's different types of concussions. So people think there's one, there's like six different types. And when there's a visual component, um, see yeah, that person. I agree. Is. I mean, the visual component is a big part of it. Not everyone with a concussion has a visual component. Right. Um, exactly. But yeah, I mean, I was fortunate enough to just to work with the U S department of defense and help co-author their, um, ocular motor dysfunction series for the military. So they have protocols that we helped establish through the military for the same thing. So, you know, we're all quite aware that, you know, concussion is something that we need to take seriously. It's always a difficult conversation with that athlete when 
Um, they want to just go back and play. You know, we all came from a generation where, you know, I probably played with multiple things I shouldn't have played with, but we rubbed dirt on it. We went and played and that's kind of what it was back then. So, you know, thankfully that's not where we are now and taking that extra week or two uh, when an athlete's 13 years old um, could save their career as opposed to putting them out there too soon. And um, we know multiple concussions lead to multiple concussions. So after that first one, you're more at risk for the second one. And certainly if you go back before you've recovered, from that fully concussion, um, you know, your, your opportunity and your likelihood for second injury is significant. So, you know, waiting that extra week to be prudent, you know, we're all parents here. So, you know, wins and losses aside, um, that's the most important thing in the world is the safety of our kids. So making sure that, you know, that little extra time sometimes is um, better safe than sorry, like we always say. Right. So, yeah. And also, just a quick little sidebar, since we have a, quite a few people. So if you're a catcher, even uh, face masks, the Ground Force 3, that is the gold standard for catcher's helmets. That's what the major league players have to wear. And they have they patented technology. They also have a, a face mask that we all know rip it. They're having a tremendous sale right now. So it's Ground Force uh, 3 and or Force 3 Ground Anyway Gear. Force 3 Gear. There we go. But I can... I'll give you that information I put on the tweet. Um, that's your head. Like, so, and your face. So anyway, just put that out there, but they're doing a tremendous sale. Um, okay, so a couple questions and then we'll open it up to our, our families because they usually have the best questions. One thing I'm a little curious about is when you were doing the assessment, is there something like the, the contrast sensitivity that was really had me curious and is there one component one of the skills that you tend to find more frequent and maybe is not addressed because people just aren't so much aware of it and it really impacts the athlete more than they probably realize and the contrast sensitivity with the different lights that was yeah, I mean, contrast sensitivity, I think, is one that's that's commonly missed in assessments. I think most mm -hmm. times if you've had an eye exam before in your life, they have looked at your visual clarity. They've looked at your eye health. They've hopefully looked at some level of muscular function and making sure that you don't have a lazy eye or a drifting muscle or something like that. But contrast, I would tell you, is missed in 90 plus percent of you know eye exams in a general retail optometry setting um, simply because they you know, blow past it or don't have the technology to deal with it. So um, if you don't have a way to fix things, you tend to not test them, I think is kind of what it's all about, but it's a very simple test. So think about it like, um, you know, again, if I'm putting up the chart and we're trying to read the smallest line on the chart, that's our visual acuity or clarity. And then what I'll do is I'll take up a 2020 line or the, the smallest line that that athlete could see, um, put that line on the chart. And then instead of making it smaller, like we normally would do, I fade the black out of the letters. So I make that black bleed out until it's essentially white. So the whole thing is invisible and we add back little bits of black, just a little bit at a time. And what we're getting is a percent saturation of how much black it took for that athlete to resolve the letters. So my estimated norm is somewhere in the 15 to 20% range. I wanna have an athlete that has between 15 to 20% contrast. Um, if it takes them 25, 30, 35% to resolve those letters, that's an issue with contrast for me. And that's where we have opportunity for using tints and filters in either glasses, tints and filters in contact lenses. We have nutritional supplementation. There are different nutritional supplements and vitamins that can be uh, used to improve contrast. There's a lot of really cool things you can do to improve contrast, but you got to test for it, right? So um, that's one, but yeah, I wouldn't say that one stands above the other, Susie. It's not, you know, for me, it's not a shotgun approach where um, you know, you treat everyone the same way, but I really try to be laser focused as to what is the specific issue for that athlete. Um, and many times they don't have an issue, right? I mean, I, working with professional baseball players, I see probably 220, 230 athletes over four rounds of MLB physicals. And, you know, 70, 80% of those athletes are absolutely perfect. So, you know, they're not gonna be playing the major leagues if they're not, right? So, I mean, I'm not trying to find problems that aren't there. So I have no problem telling an athlete that there's not deficiency in your profile. You look fantastic. You have perfect softball eyes. So that's fun. Now let's talk about how you can get better. And that's where we go into the enhancement phase. And there's lots of things that we can then take our athletes that are 2015 crystal clear, no visual deficiency at all at the major league level. But when you're trying to hit 98, 99, 100, 
consistently with movement, we're going to take every advantage we can get. Yeah. And so everybody's like busy. There's so much time and they're like, okay, I have this and this and this I need to do. If you, what would be like one or two things? If you said, if you can only do one or two things, if you only had 10 minutes a day, if you only had 15 minutes a day, if you do these things, or if you do this every other day, this would give you the best bang for your buck time. Is there anything, or does that go back to, hey, I know not the shotgun approach. I, I understand it, but let's kind of go reality. Like, you know, they, right now, if there was something, what would you do knowing that it's still a just kind of throwing a blanket over everything. Yeah, sure. I mean, so, I mean, some of the easiest ones that we have, you know, the vision ring that you're looking right there in the picture on the right is the simplest, easiest drill that you could possibly imagine, but it's fun. It's easy. You can use it in the backyard with your own kid. Um, the strobe training glasses are amazing uh, simply because you can do just about anything with them from doing T work to doing some soft toss to doing a little infield drill. Um, so again, you can be creative as to what you want to do based on the position of that athlete, whether they're an outfielder or a catcher or whatever. Um, but the other thing that I think you mentioned there, which is really critical is it doesn't take hours and hours to do this stuff. We have great research and studies behind this that says that, you know, a lot of the studies were done in the Air Force Academy's sports programs, Duke University sports programs. Um, and we have, you know, pages of data that says that all we need is about three times a week for 10 to 15 minutes of this type of visual training to make a difference uh, and to keep it. So, you know, for athletes that are going out, you know, once a week and throwing a vision ring around, they're kind of having fun. But if you have an athlete that's engaged enough to pick up that vision ring three times a week for 15 minutes, they're actually changing the brain neurologically and they'll keep those effects. So we know the strobe training, the visual training, the goal for me is always to get my athletes engaged three times a week, 15 minutes. And that's, that's kind of that benchmark. So whether it be technology that's low tech and low cost, which is easy enough to use, colored balls, bean bags, vector balls, vision rings. You know, again, the essential training pack is filled with all kinds of things like that. Simple focusing beads, uh, reaction balls, bean bags that you can throw with different colors and make the athlete do different things. Um, very simple things, very low cost things with some direction. And then adding that layer of complexity is let's take any of those drills and add a strobe to them which, you know, again, if none of you are familiar with the strobe training, that would be, you know, any of us trying to go out and hit a softball with all the lights on in the stadium, right? And we're going out there taking our swings and doing, you know, toss off, off the mound. And then, you know, Susie, because she's like this, she'll go over to the light switch and start flipping it on and off. And you imagine trying to make that same contact with the pitch, now only seeing it while the lights are literally flipping on and off. So it's a strobe light effect where you still need to do the same thing, which is in that case, make contact with a softball, but now your brain is getting less information. So instead of seeing the pitch all the way from release point to when you're gonna initiate your swing, you're only getting bits and pieces of that pitch in its, in its trajectory to you and your contact point. So you're limiting your brain of visual information. So when you do training with a strobe, and again, it can be open-ended to what that training is. It can be catching, fielding, soft toss, T work, whatever. Um, but by doing that training with your brain, what you're doing by the time you get back on the field after that three times a week, 15 minutes, and literally the other part of that study was it takes as little as two sessions to already start making a difference in the brain. So two sessions, you already make a difference. And so that athlete goes out, they start to see that ball literally moving in slow motion. So they're processing things at such a faster rate. Their brain is making decisions at a quicker pace so that the ball literally looks like it's moving in slow motion to them. That's how strobes work. And I can tell you, we have multiple pairs right now in West Palm Beach, and we're using them in the hitting cages right now. Could, so somebody says, could they just, could you just close your eyes and open them? I know that seems so basic, but does, is it just obscuring the vision or is, is closing the eyes? And I mean, if you just said just blank and you had a metronome, I'm just, Thinking Absolutely. off the top of my head, metronome, yeah. and you blink on the metronome because you don't have a pair of strobes. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we do drills in the NFL where we have an athlete that has their back to the quarterback, and then we tell him to turn. He's got to make a catch because he couldn't see it, right? So that's still basically a strobe effect, right? Mm -hmm. um, back in the day, this is, boy, I'm dating myself now, but 23 years or so with uh, DC United, which is our professional sports team, our soccer team in town, we used to have a, a player's lounge off to the side of our locker room. 
and they had a ping pong table because the guys you'd like to play ping pong while they were kind of waiting for practice or games or whatever. So we actually took an old school strobe light that we used to buy at like Spencer's gift for like 20 bucks. And we put it in the room and we turned the strobe light on and they played ping pong with the strobe light on. So, you know, lower cost, lower tech, but, you know, absolutely the same effect because the brain is having to make a decision, which is in that case, making a contact with that ping pong paddle with less information. So it doesn't necessarily matter what you're doing as a drill. It's more what's happening in the brain that's going to carry over to the field. And so, again, I always kind of think if you can make it more sports specific, then the athlete tends to be more engaged. So if you have something like the strobe glasses, the benefit there is you can actually go on the field, put on your glove, use some soft toss, use your bat, use things like that. Obviously, my caveat is never use live pitching, live toss and live swing because we don't take one in the face with a pair of strobe training glasses on. So um, you'd be surprised what you see people do. But, you know, safety first, obviously be smart, but it doesn't necessarily matter. We could go out and play some hoops, play basketball on the side of your house or, you know, do a little, um, I don't know, volleyball drill or whatever. Whatever you're doing with the strobe lights on is changing your brain for your game of play. Um, there's some things like a visual edge game sense. And I think both of those are actually kind of like partners with you. So, and then of course you mentioned the win reality. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, any... so I mean, great technologies. It's a fun time to be involved in sports vision. Believe me, 25 years ago, we didn't have all these really cool things, these computer apps, these programs. Um, yeah, again, that's, you know, sports vision pros is meant to be, um, you know, a sort of a sounding board where we want people to hear about technologies. We want companies to come on and present the technology they have. Uh, we don't necessarily promote anything. We just want you to know what's out there and then discuss the science behind it. Um, so in something like visual ed, you're dealing with, when we talked about that testing phase, looking at one, two, and three, more the muscular part of that testing. So if we found deficiencies in an athlete um, in depth perception or physical eye movement, strength, eye tracking, it may be something that I would prescribe is I would say to one of your kids, you know what, hey, there's this program called Visual Edge, you might already be familiar with it. But if not, it might be a great thing for you to do, because that is one of the deficiencies in the profile here, that would be very effectively trained with Visual Edge. Um, game Sense, as another example, is completely different. So in game mm -hmm. sense, you're not really training anything muscular. You're doing everything neurologically and you're doing pitch recognition, right? In a softball environment. So you're getting live pitching, you're getting live video. It's a great little drill. It's a great game. Uh, I know the developer. I know the guy that built the thing. He's a great guy. Comes out of Boston University. A lot of great research behind it. Um, but it's a cool program. We actually helped film some of the video that goes into the AAA baseball side of it in the Nats uh, a couple of years ago. So I helped him with it because I thought it had a lot of validity um, the win reality, I think takes it to a whole nother level, right? Cause now you're in a virtual environment, you're seeing a pitch, uh, and you're actually swinging, taking a motor mechanical movement. Um, this is where I can talk to you as a coach and ask you what your opinion is on the motor mechanics, because I've heard it all over the place from athletes who love to swing with their sort of simulated bat and other athletes that hate it. And they like what they see in VR. They like being able to see the pitch and the trajectory of the pitch, but they like to just kind of use the triggers and react and not necessarily do a mechanical swing. Again, that's up to the athlete, but I think the environment of VR and what we can do in VR is pretty cool. So that's where I built my game is in VR. I look forward to seeing it. So um, last question then. Uh, so other thing like uh, sunglasses. So like simple things, you're on the field, somebody gets a pair of sunglasses. Is there anything or maybe uh, explore wearing sunglasses at night? Because I remember like, Nike, they used to have the contact lenses. Mm -hmm. and it might get to, so there's some really cool just technology like that. So is there anything like sunglasses um, that people should be looking for when they get them? Yeah. So the thing about sunglasses is, you know, there's two parts to it, right? One is the frame. So making sure that it fits properly, whether it's not something you're going to be hitting with because it has a prescription or not, but uh, something that's going to have to fit under a helmet or something that you're going to use in the field for fielding, making sure it's comfortable from a frame standpoint, making sure it's protective. So, so making sure you have a sport safe frame from again, any of the sport active lines, Under Armour, Nike, Oakley, we mentioned a couple of them earlier. <laughs> Every company, once you get inside of the company, whether it's again, Under Armour, Nike, Oakley, they all have their you know, different tints and their, you know, progression through those tints. So they're going to give you direction as to their field tint in Nike in Oakley, let's say, 
where they have a high contrast tint, which might be something you could use in low light level situations where they may also have something that's kind of like a, a dark, you know, prism iridium. So that's, you know, meant for that really super sunny day where the sun's blazing in the outfield and you want something that's going to knock down the most amount of brightness. So, you know, we'll have athletes that have, you know, kind of low light level day sunglasses and really bright day sunglasses. So you can do that. Some of these lenses have inserts, so you can actually pop them in and out. One of the new Nike lenses called the Nike Fly Free has a little button on the side. So you can literally plop the lenses out and pop new lenses in. So you can get to a game and tournaments are a perfect example where maybe you have a 11 o'clock game and it's blazing sun on a June day and then the clouds come over and that you know pair of prescription sunglasses that athlete was playing with are now too dark. So they hit the button, pop it out, put the clear lenses in and off they go playing with clear lenses or under the lights lenses. So uh, those are pretty cool. Um, the tints in the contact lenses, again, are, are right there as well. So we have tinted contact lenses as well as things like blue blocking contact lenses. So we have lenses that are designed to enhance night vision by filtering the specific wavelengths of light that come off uh, the stadium lighting. So pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of great things in the world of um, of the glasses standpoint, um, the, the contact lenses as well. So you know, a lot of technologies that are out there. I think it's just, again, part of talking to your doctor about it, asking them the questions. You know, again, I'm not advocating to take you away from your wonderful doctors that hopefully you're all working with. So talk to them. They're educated enough to be able to advise you on the right tint you should be picking out based on the environment you're playing in and the sport you're playing. So. So there is things to it, because sometimes you see that and you go, oh, that's kind of a cool little marketing thing. And it's not really needed. But if I'm understanding you correctly, that it could make a could make a difference. I mean, there is some science behind it. So maybe yeah, worth, you know, what they call tint science, which is absolutely a big uh, marketing part of of building the Oakley lens portfolio, the Nike lens portfolio, and, and and all the others. So they do a lot of research and a lot of science on these things. So if they tell you if it's a field tint, it I'd believe it. I mean, it's and our athletes will definitely see the difference. So we it's part of educating them a little bit in spring training because they'll come in with you know, just a cool pair of sunglasses they wore in college with no real idea why. Um, and then we talk to them about why they should have maybe this for this and this for that. Um, and they understand it. It makes a big difference because at this level, it's it's massive improvement sometimes. Okay, that's awesome. Super interesting. Okay, yeah. Um, questions? Anybody have a question? Fire yeah. away. Yeah. He's on the hot seat. <laughs> Bring it. Anything. Just don't ask me to hit your pitching, Susie. <laughs> I'm not doing that. My days have <laughs> passed, buddy. I can see it. I just can't hit it. If you have a question, just feel free to, you should be able to unmute yourself. So, and if five people jump in at once, go one at a time. So. Yeah, I'll start. This is Su this is Vince, Susie. Hey, uh, hey, Doc. Thanks for the time. Of course. Uh, quick question. So, is the best place to start just you know with like an annual eye exam in your facility, uh, given you know the the softball player and sort of the perspective that you would give versus a normal eye doctor like my eye doctor? Is the annual exam kind of the best place to start? Is is I guess generally my question. 100%. Yeah, that's always. And again, I spent years inside of our national organization called the American Optometric Association. I was the chairman of our sports and performance vision committee. That's the first thing we always said is every player should have an annual eye exam every year. You know, these are all youth athletes. They're growing, they're changing. Uh, we know that there's a potential for prescription change up until about the end of college. So about 21, 22 is when athletes are going to finally level off as far as their distance correction. So every year, absolutely get them checked. This is a difficult, challenging game. I just see one of my patients actually on the phone here. So hi, Maria. I just saw her <laughs> last week. So hello. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. Always annual eye exam first, just kind of see there. And then again, I, I think one of the things that separates sometimes sports docs from not necessarily sports docs is just the understanding of the, the difficulty and the complexity of different sports. So um, at the end right. of your regular routine eye exam, if they say, you know what, she's great. She's 20, 30 and not having any trouble. Um, that may be great for the average Joe, but I think it's the understanding that our game in softball is really demanding and really difficult. So maybe 2030 isn't their bar for getting a kid a first pair of glasses who's 12, 
But if I have a softball player who's 20, 30, they're getting something for playing softball. So they might not need it in the mm. classroom, but softball is a different game and it gets challenging very quickly at a young age, as we know how much quicker that game starts to move once they hit those middle school years. It's a challenging game. So my bar is a little bit lower um, as to where I might start interventions. So that would be a, probably the only thing I would say is different in a comprehensive eye exam. Um, okay. So yeah, definitely start there. Great call. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Um, we have a question from Emily. And are there any specific drills that you recommend for picking up spin on a pitch as a batter? Yeah, so the vision ring that you're seeing is actually spinning balls. So those, you know, can be um, some of the balls are colored. So it makes it very easy to kind of grab the right color when you're trying to catch it. Um, but then other ones are not colored. So we have white balls with different, you know, kind of colors on them, different letters on them. Um, inside the essential pack is what's called a, a eye tracking ball. So it's literally a ball with different targets on it. You simply move the targets around and you try to track the different targets and see the letters or numbers on the ball. Um, back in the day, you know, again, we used to put letters, numbers, and markings on balls in a pitching machine. Yes. We still do it, right? So uh, Daniel Murphy was one of our guys with the Nats who was a huge vision training guy. And he would come with his own bag of balls that had, you know, green diamonds and red circles and blue squares. And he would tell you exactly what he was hitting every time he was hit. Uh, he also put little numbers on the plate. So he would tell you that he hit a red circle at number three and he hit a green triangle at number five where it crossed the plate. He was that in tune to focusing on pitching and seeing what was coming um, that he had his decision made up long before he started his swing. So, you know, things like that where you can put markings on balls and actually track those balls. Great little drill. Awesome. So inside Sports Vision Pros too, there's a thing called the right eye training room. The right eye training room has something like 200 different vision drills that are all, again, all of this is free access. You can do it anytime you want. Just take a look through there a little bit. You can find all kinds of different little drills, some that may not be very appropriate for softball, some that you go, okay, I can see where I could use this because I'm a catcher. I could use this because I'm an infielder. I could use this for hitting. So there's a lot of simple, easy to use drills in that little uh, playbook there. That's awesome. Okay, anybody else? And put it in the chat. My yeah. papers in the chat. Mike. Hey Keith, it's Mike. Uh, first, hey, Mike. thanks, thanks for your responsiveness and willingness to do this for us. I know Susie goes way back with you. I've had players see you as far as I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. But um, I, I've I, I have a couple questions. Um, you might know Greg Ritchie. He was a parent of uh, one of my players. Um, he's a GW uh, head baseball coach. And when he was with the Pirates, they did a lot of testing. But he has his players now at GW getting their eyes tested a lot of times twice a year because of all the mm -hmm. blue screen time, stuff like that. So that's sure. question one. I'm just curious about that. Uh, the trends you're seeing in blue screen time and, and effects on vision. Mm -hmm. Also, um, got to uh, work with Dr. Kang. We, we had his daughter through our program yeah. and he would, he would fit Ava with uh, glasses in school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he would put her in like 2015 contacts for softball. So yep. I'm curious to know what you thought about that. Yeah. That particular. Uh, well, let's work backwards. Cause that's actually a funny story. So um, Paul's a great friend of mine. We've known each other a long, long time. Um, yeah. The person that put Ava into contact lenses was not Paul. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. 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 So it, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Paul Kang is a good friend of mine who's a cataract surgeon and a LASIK surgeon. So uh, ophthalmologist that used to be in town, he actually retired, believe it or not. He's younger than I am. Uh, retired, moved to Connecticut. But, you know, super person and uh, was uh, mortified when I put his daughter into contact lenses. And he said, how did I miss this? It was so funny. Um, and I was like, dude, she's a softball player, man. You can't just, you know, be close. And he's like, oh my gosh, you're hundred percent right. So, um, you know, even though her vision was kind of okay for school and she could kind of wear the glasses every once in a while, when she got a chance to put on that correction to play her sport, it was massively different. I mean, she's a talented kid and now she can actually see the ball too. Holy cow, you know? So right. that was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, I'm all for that. I, I have no problem putting kids into contact lenses at a young age, if they're mature enough and they can handle it. Uh, my youngest contact lens patient was three. So I don't have a problem with contact lenses and kids, you know, they're safe, they're daily disposable lenses. You just got to have a mature enough kid that can wash their hands before they touch their eyeballs. Uh, and if we can monitor that and teach them how to get them in and out safely, 
I am all for kids and consequences. Um, so yeah. I'm all for that. Um, with the blue block, specifically, specifically how you put her in 2015s, was there also a little advantage in going to that acuity? Yeah, I mean, we we push the acuity in in the games that we're talking about in baseball and softball, just because of seams and rotation and clarity is such a critical component to that game. You know, 2015, it's definitely something I'm pushing for. Um, the average acuity in Major League Baseball is 2012. Average. Right. Right. That's average. Right. So 2020 is a line and a half below average for us in Major League Baseball. So, you know, we don't have to be close. We have to be better than perfect. So, yeah, I mean, and, and compared that to a sport like the NBA, where I'll be covering tomorrow night, those guys could be perfectly effective and be 10 year NBA all stars at 2030, 2040. You know, they don't have anything that they need to see clearly. They need to have good depth perception. They need to have good ball skills, good reaction speed. So it's funny how every sport's a little different in their visual needs, uh, but in baseball and softball specifically, acuity is huge. So, yeah, I mean, no doubt. I always try to push that way. Um, but the the blue block in the second you know exam, I think that's fine. I think it's a good idea. A lot of times I'll see an athlete who is changing quickly in their prescription and tell them, you know, I mean, look, none of our kids have a, have a season off anymore, right? They just roll right from high school sports to travel sports in the summertime and then right back into tournaments in the fall again. So there's no real off season for them. So I try to get them, if they're changing you know, rapidly enough, at least twice a year. So we're getting them before their college showcases or before their tournament seasons. Um, the blue light blocking, I think is there's something to it. There's no doubt about it. Um, the two things they say for the most part is that it either creates eye strain, muscle strain, um, or we have this, you know, protective concern because blue light is right next to ultraviolet light on the light spectrum. So when you talk about what ultraviolet light can do to a body, we all know if we go out in the summertime and don't take care of ourselves with ultraviolet light, we end up with sunburns and all kinds of things. Well, right beside UV light on the light spectrum is the blue light, the 480 nanometer blue light, which is what we get off digital devices. The highest emitter of blue light is actually the sun but we're talking about this stuff coming off of our iPads and screens all day long. And I have absolutely seen athletes convinced that they couldn't see, that they were having distance vision issues, that they needed glasses or contact lenses. And I'm talking about professionals as well. Uh, that were absolutely in muscle spasm from over-focusing their eyes at near vision. So after visual training and after some different types of things that they needed to kind of release that muscle spasm, they ended up not needing glasses or contact lenses at all to play their game. They just needed some relief from their, you know, eight inch screen time that they sit there for, you know, hours and hours at a time. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Actually, and Dr. Smith, and kind of piggybacking on that one, um, with the screen time and all that, are you finding that there's more nearsightedness or things of that nature? Um, yeah, just with the... There's an yeah. epidemic of nearsightedness globally. It's it's increasing at a faster rate than it ever has. Um, there's especially inside of optometry called myopia control, which is a way of controlling the amount of nearsighted progression. So we have a doctor in our practice, Dr. Mallory Cookham, who's amazing, um, who does our myopia control. So when you have a family history of high nearsightedness and you have a kid that starts with glasses at six, they're not going to get better. They're only going to get worse. The question is at what rate? And so so now we have opportunities with different types of eye drops, different medicated eye drops, uh, different types of contact lenses, even different types of eyeglass lenses that can be used to kind of limit the progression of myopia. So it limits how nearsighted they become, which we know is important because the more nearsighted someone becomes, the more chance of eye disease and problems they can have, like retinal detachments and retinal tears. So um, we want to progress, you know, as slowly a rate as we possibly can. So um we definitely know that there's an increasing rate. We don't know if that's due to their screen time, their lack of time outside. Um, we saw an incidence of, of myopia increase dramatically during the pandemic, just because kids were locked into screens much more than they ever were before for a couple of years at a time. That didn't help anybody's nearsighted progression. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a tie. Is there like any recommendation that you say, hey, at this point, if you're in front of a screen, be it your phone or iPad or laptop, whatever, once you get over know, six hours, then things, or if you start feeling your eyes tired, I mean, anything of that nature, because 
obviously that's going to impact your athletic performance as well, but yeah. just things of that nature to be mindful of. So, I mean, it's, you know, the great thing as a parent, we all say all in moderation, right? So, I mean, everything good comes in smaller doses. So I try to get my kids off of it, but it's, you know, it's their life, right? I mean, it's their right. connection to their sports. It's their college recruiting right now. It's, you know, their school, their academics, it's where they're studying. So, you know, they don't have textbooks anymore. They're doing all this stuff on this stupid laptop. So it's hard to get away from it. Right. Um, the thing I would say, I mean, we have this funny thing that we talk about with 2020 all the time. So we have this thing called the 2020 rule, which says every 20 minutes that you're on near focusing or near device to look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. So breaking it up three times an hour, looking down a hall, looking out a window, looking somewhere at distance kind of helps those eye muscles to relax. One of the things that you would learn going through a sport vision assessment and testing is that you know, the eye muscles are no different than the other muscle in the body. There's contraction and relaxation. The relaxation of the eye muscles is distance focus. The contraction to the eye muscles is near focus. So the more you're focused up close, the more tense, the more muscle spasm you're looking to develop, unfortunately. So what we tell them to do is, like I said, every 20 minutes you're on a device, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Look out a window, That's look down the hall, give them that rule, go back to your focusing, do your thing. So that's every 20 minutes, three times an hour, look down the hall, look out a window. It's not too much to ask, but it can help those muscles stay in better focusing habits. No, that's awesome. That's that's a great tidbit. Okay, great. Any other questions? This has been fun. That was fun, Susie. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> anybody, anybody else? Okay, well, this is awesome. It's about an hour we took. You're so generous with your time. Um, definitely Thank this you. is recorded. And um, when we get more, I'd love to have you come back. I'm kind of like do an update and uh, just love all the resources. Your website is chock full of just free, wonderful content uh, to help a coach, parent, player. I mean, anybody. And like I said, it's, it's fitting because that's just who you are. So we're, um, we're having a blast. We're enjoying it. It's a lot of passionate people that love doing the same thing I love doing just in different parts of the country. So these are good friends of mine. They, they're all doing it for the right reasons. Um, we all come from a slightly different background, which is kind of fun. Um, Dr. Horner is actually the clinical professor at the optometry school in Portland, Oregon. So he is actually the dean of the optometry school. So he has all of his sports programs going through vision training, going through vision testing, and he's teaching students every day, all of this stuff, which is really cool. Um, Dr. Cunningham is in Austin. He actually works for a laser surgery center. So he's a, he's with an ophthalmologist doing surgery all day, but works with the university of Texas, Texas Rangers, a lot of the different teams down in Texas. Um, and like I said, Dr. Nancy does, you know, pretty much everything I do in South Florida. So, you know, we all just really have fun doing this stuff. So hopefully that comes across. We have a good time in a lot of our interviews and content. Um, I just did one actually recent. So the next things you'll see on there, uh, I had a major league baseball umpire. Um, did a whole interview with him talking about what they look at as an umpire, um, where they look in the strike zone, how they feel about digital cameras and some of the strike zone monitoring. Um, really fun. It was a fun conversation. He was a former catcher himself who's now behind the catcher, which is really cool. So you'll see a lot of segments on that coming up soon in Sports Vision Pros on the on the catcher side. I will send you a link when I have that video game out um, so yeah. that you can just share that with everyone, anyone with an Oculus. If you're not familiar with the Oculus system, you're just uploading games just like you would on an Xbox or PlayStation. So your kid probably has a million games on your Oculus right now, but this will be just another game that they could purchase out of the game store, but low cost can be like 10 bucks or something like that so that anyone in the world can do it. Uh, but literally we built it with, you know, years of visual science behind it. So it's going to feel like you're playing a fun little video game. It's actually quite fun. It's a kind of first person shooter shooting gallery kind of thing where you have <laughs> aliens and droids attacking you and you have to shoot different colored droids with different colored guns. You have depth perception targets and things. It's, it's really kind of fun. So we're kind of hiding vision training inside of a game that just feels like you're playing a game. So that was kind of the idea. Yeah, that, that sounds fun. So, so again, I'll keep can't you wait. Out. I will. Okay, awesome. Well, again, thank you, uh, Glory Families. Thank you for uh, for jumping on and investing and getting this information. Because I'll be sending the link um, to all of our families because I know there was a number that wanted to be able to join us live, but they'll get the recording and I'll get that to you as well, Dr. Love Smith. It. Thanks so, for having okay. me. Steve. Thanks for all, all your right. time, everybody. Have a great season. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.